Every Advance Wars fan knows the joy of seeing that glorious letter S after a tough battle. But how do rankings actually work? And did you know that the ranking system changed slightly across the games before it was completely overhauled in Days of Ruin? In this video, I'll be discussing the ranking system, the formulas used to calculate each score, and how they change from game to game. Advance Wars 1 laid down most of the groundwork for the rating system. At the end of each campaign mission and war room map, you're ranked on three categories, speed, power, and technique. The end of the final field training gives you a vague tutorial on this, but its information is vague at best and outright wrong at worst, so let's go over all of these individually. First is speed. This measures how quickly you finish a mission. Every map has a par time for a perfect score, and the formula for speed is 100 minus 100 over 3 times your completion time minus the map's par time over the map's par time. Think of it this way, you start with a perfect speed score, and for every day you go over the par time, you lose points. The power score is the most obtuse of the three. The game tells you that it's about how many enemy units you destroy, but it's actually based on the maximum number of enemies you destroy in one turn, compared to the total number of enemy deployed units. The formula is maximum enemies destroyed in one day times 10 times 100 over total enemies. This might sound complicated, but it's actually pretty simple if you think of it this way. You need to destroy at least 10% of the enemy's total forces in one day. And in a lot of maps, this number is not as high as you might think. For example, the first mission of the Advance Wars 1 campaign, It's War, has Olaf with an army of 17 units. This means you only need to destroy two of his units in one day to get a perfect power score. Of course, that's a pre-deploy map. The more deployment facilities the enemy has, the harder it is to get a perfect power score. The toughest missions for this are Advance Wars 2's factory maps, where the enemy will be churning out free units every day. For those, you want to finish the mission as fast as possible, which is also good for your speed rank. Typically, you'll go for a good power score on the turn you pop your CO power. Last, we come to the technique rating. This is very simple. It's based on the number of units you've lost compared to the total number of units you deployed. The formula is total units minus lost units times 100 over total units plus mode bonus. The mode bonus is either 20 for campaign mode, or 10 for war room. Like power, this one is simple if you explain it like this. You need to lose no more than 20% of your army in campaign mode, or no more than 10% of your army in war room. A common trick for getting a good technique score, on maps that let you deploy units, is to spam units in the last few turns, as having a bigger total army will offset your losses. You might want to remember this for later though. Each of these formulas will give you a number between 0 and 100 for this score. However, Advance Wars 1 doesn't directly show you how many points you got in each category, it just represents it as a bar. But if you play War Room, it does show you your total score, and you might notice that despite these categories being out of 100, your total is out of 999. What's up with that? Well, it's simple. The game just multiplies your speed score by 5, your power score by 2, and your technique score by 3. This actually means that the different categories are weighted in Advance Wars 1, and that speed is worth half your total score, while power is only worth 20% of it. To get an S rank, you need to score 950 points or higher. Any lower and your rank will be A, B, C, or even D or E. Yes, these two ranks actually exist in Advance Wars 1, though in practice, for most campaign missions, it's hard to get them without intentionally trying. 
Also, you cannot get S ranks in field training. The maximum rank there is A. Advance Wars 1 is also unique in the series in that its hard mode, Advance Campaign, handles ranks a bit differently. In Advance Campaign, your power and technique scores are rigged to always be perfect, which means that only the speed score matters. This leads to a couple of odd quirks. First, it's impossible to score anything lower than a C in Advance Campaign. And second, it means that missions where your objective is to survive for a certain number of days are an automatic S rank in advance mode as long as you win, since their part time is equal to their time limits. It's arguably harder to S rank those missions in normal campaign where you have to care about your power and technique scores. In Advance Wars 1, your ranking points are converted into coins which you use to buy new maps and commanders from Hachi's shop. In Advance Wars 2 Black Hole Rising, the formulas for each category are the same as the first game, but they're no longer multiplied. Your final score is out of 300, and every category contributes to it equally. To get an S rank, you need to score 280 points or higher. They also ditch the D and E ranks. The lowest rank you can get in Advance Wars 2 and onward is a C. They also abandoned the coin system. Now, the points themselves are the currency you use to buy things from Hachi. With points being earned in the hard campaign worth double there. However, unlike Advance Wars 1's hard mode, your power and technique scores actually matter here. As hard campaign uses the exact same ranking system the normal one does. Two of the COs in this game are unlocked by getting high ranks in the campaign mode. Doesn't have to be hard mode either. Nell is unlocked by getting an overall A rank, and getting an overall S rank will unlock Sturm, so you can make all your friends hate you. Speaking of the campaign, one thing I'd like to talk about in Advance Wars 2 is multi-commander missions, because they work a little interestingly when it comes to rankings. Technically, everything I say here also applies to Advance Wars 1, but that game only had two multi-commander missions. So, how this works is that speed obviously is the same for everyone, but only one commander's power and technique scores count towards your final ranking. And you can tell who it is because they're the one who speaks on the victory screen. For most multiplayer missions, this is the commander in the player one slot, which is usually the commander for whichever country you're in. But for the last two missions, Hot Pursuit and Final Front, it's the commander who fires the shot that ends the mission, whose scores are the ones that count. For example, you'll notice here in Final Front that my final scores are different when Kanbei ends the map as opposed to when Grit does. When going for an S rank in these missions, you'll need to carefully plan out who gets the final blow, because you'll want it to be somebody who got a lot of kills in one turn and who didn't suffer many losses. This works a little differently in Jewel Strike, and speaking of which... Jewel Strike's ranking system is almost identical to Advance Wars 2, but the way that the technique score is calculated for multi-team missions in campaign mode is a little different. Some sources out there say that power is calculated differently too. This is not the case. I've tested this, and as you can see in this take of Verdant Hills, I get a different power score when the red team ends this map, as compared to when the blue team does. So I'm inclined to believe power is still the power score of whichever army wins the mission. But technique takes into account all allied armies in Jewel Strike. As you can see here, it's the same score regardless of which team gets the final blow. I've done the maths and it seems like the formula simply combines the total deployed units and losses of every allied army and treats them as one big army. Jewel Strike also awards bonus points based on destructible objects, but it should be noted that these do not contribute to your ranking. If you scored 270 points and destroyed one mini cannon, you would still get an A rank. These extra points are just a bonus for the shop. Jewel Strike also features a survival mode that consists of mini-maps. 
These maps rank you out of 50 in each category rather than 100, but other than that, their ranking system is the same. Next up is the game you've all been waiting for. Battalion Wars! Yep, this game uses a ranking system too, and it's very similar to the Game Boy Advance games. The difference is that speed, power, and technique are percentages, and your final score is an average of all 3%, rather than out of 300. Speed and technique work pretty much the same way they do in the Game Boy Advance games. Speed is just measured in real time, rather than turns. Power, though, is a bit different. From what I can tell, every map in Battalion Wars has specific enemy units that are marked as counting for power. And to get a good power score, you just have to destroy as many of those units as possible. And now we come to Days of Ruin, which radically overhauled the rank system. This one took a while for people to crack, so thank you to those on the Wars World News forum for finally figuring out these formulas. The first thing you should know about Days of Ruin's ranking system is that every category is ranked out of 150 now. You only need 300 points for an S rank, but the maximum possible score is 450, at least in theory. It turns out that many campaign maps simply don't have enough units on the map for you to max out the power and technique scores. The formulas for all three score categories were changed, and all of them have two formulas now. If the first formula results in a number lower than 100, the second formula is used instead. Let's go over speed first. The first formula is 200 minus completion day times 100 over par time. If this ends up less than 100, then a second formula is used that is much closer to the original Advance Wars formula. The par time in Days of Ruin is for a score of 100 points, but you're rewarded with extra points for every day you finish ahead of the par time, up to a maximum of 150. In order to get 150 points in speed, you have to finish the map in exactly half the par time or less. So a map with a par time of 10 would need to be finished in 5 days or less. Power and technique are very, very different to the original games though. Power is no longer based on the number of kills in a single turn. It's actually based on how much damage you do over the number of total attacks you made. The idea being to maximize the damage you deal in every engagement. The first formula is total of damage percentages plus number of enemies destroyed times 100 over total number of times you attacked. For the power score, I feel like an actual play-by-play -play makes it easier to understand. So here's me going through the first mission of Days of Ruin, and these are all the damage numbers of every attack I made. It's the actual damage numbers you see here in the combat preview that are what's added to the formula. This means that luck damage doesn't directly influence your power score in Days of Ruin, but it can indirectly change it, since units with lower HP receive less benefits from terrain, so dealing one or two points of extra damage will change the damage values of later attacks against the same targets. In other words, high score runs do often have to reset maps due to luck rolls. The second important thing to note about the power score is that only damage and kills that happen during your turn count. Any damage dealt or kills made by counterattacks are completely ignored by this formula. Now on the one hand, this is really bad. You want to make sure you minimize the number of enemies that die to counterattacks. But on the other hand, if you use counterattacks to soften up enemies so that you can deal more damage on your turn, that can help improve your power score. On maps with AI-controlled allies, their attacks will also influence your power score. The odd thing I find about Days of Ruin's power score is that it kind of encourages you to play like Greyfield. You need to go for overkill wherever possible. Destroying a unit with 1 HP left with an attack that does 100% damage is better than with an attack that does 10% damage. 
and you'll want to deploy a lot of powerful units like bombers and war tanks and use them to bully enemy units far below their pay grade. It doesn't exactly encourage you to make cost-effective engagements. But on the other hand, it seems like the developers wanted to encourage quality over quantity in army composition in this game's story mode. And for that, we're going to get to the technique score, because this also works very differently. The first technique formula is 62.5 times number of deployed enemy units minus number of times enemy units joined over number of deployed allied units plus number of allied units lost plus 50. While this formula is affected by allied losses to an extent, it's actually more based on defeating a larger enemy force with a smaller force. And it's easy to see what they were going for here. They wanted to discourage flooding out infantry in the last few turns to inflate your technique score, like you could in the first three Advance Wars games. Instead, the mantra is, only build the units you need and keep them alive, which actually fits pretty well with the post-apocalypse theme. I'm going more into personal opinion now, but the problem I have with this is that it actually rewards you for letting the enemy deploy more units, and also runs contrary to the speed score for that reason. But I digress, that's how the technique score works in Days of Ruin. So in this game, getting S ranks is relatively easy. The real challenge is going for the highest score possible. Any score above 100 points in any category is purely for bragging rights, but I've seen a lot of fun competitions on forums over this. Just remember that if you are going for a good ranking run of Days of Ruin, you need to play very differently to how you would for a good ranking run of the earlier games. And that's how rankings work in every Advance Wars game up to Days of Ruin. As of recording this, I don't know whether or not Reboot Camp will change up the ranking system, but I'd like to know what you all think about it. Which ranking system is your favourite? Me personally, I like the way Days of Ruin calculates power, but I prefer the technique rating from the earlier games. This is Big Clingy signing off, happy S-rank hunting everyone!